All right, you guys, we're going to pick up our discussion where we left off. We were talking about introduction to, to physical oceanography and, and background on our water planet. And where we ended last time was, was a discussion about how some of these basic physical properties, things like circulation, things... <coughs> Excuse me, man. Yeah, I'm sneezing. Thanks. <coughs> Holy cow! What the heck's going on here? Okay. Let's start over again. Ah. Mm. So to continue on with our conversation about physical oceanography and all this stuff and potential uh, implications for various management challenges that we might see in the future, um, we we ended off with talking about the distribution of sediments, precipitates, across the ocean, and how, at least grossly speaking, the stuff that's there is a consequence of the, the physics, the aspects of water that make our planet a, a really cool place to hang. So we talked about that last time. Another thing that I want to talk about is another, or want to start talking about today, is another um, example of precipitation from the water. This is the Solara One project in Papua New Guinea by this, uh, this group called Nautilus. And uh, these guys are interested in mining the bottom, uh, mining stuff from the bottom of the ocean, taking uh, mineral-rich substances and bring them to the surface and then processing them and then using them uh, in whatever it is, electronics, manufacturing, what have you. This is a really interesting story and I just want to tell you, you guys a little bit about it. Um, uh, this was just in the news a couple days ago because of another release of declassified documents. But this whole notion, so this this right now is going on. This is, these, this is a group from Canada. I'll watch some videos in a, in a few moments. But, but this is an international group that thinks they can make money uh, removing substances from the bottom of the ocean. The, the nut of this comes from a lie that was perpetuated during the Cold War. So this was in the time of the so-called nuclear sea race, not the space race, but the sea race when the Soviet Union and the Western allies, primarily the United States and its allies, were, were working at odds against each other, right? This, this so-called Cold War. And one of the key things there was to have submarines, primarily so they could deliver massive death and annihilate the planet, because we thought that was a great idea. Uh, we apparently still think that's a great idea. Um, and submarine technology was, a, was an important Thing that was being developed by everybody in all sides and trying to make things go faster, deeper, quieter, all of this and that. In 1968 alone, we lose four submarines, um, uh, the US and the Soviets, including um, one of our uh, uh, biggest losses, this one called the Scorpion, that went down. One of the ones the Soviet lost was, was called K-129. And the Soviets at the time did not have anything anywhere near as sophisticated as our subsea tracking technology. So we have, we have had and we continue to have this array of acoustic listening stations across the world's oceans where we can passively listen to sounds and discern if that's a ship, ship's motor turning or if that's a whale, a whale you know, breaching or what have you. So we actually knew the American Navy paired with the Air Force. The Air Force knew about um, how sounds pro you know, propagate and everything. And so the Navy had this, this passive acoustic network. And they, they got together with, the, with the, uh, their Air Force friends. And they figured out where this sub sank, where this Russian sub sank. And something on the order of, I forget, 98, uh, something like that, 98 Russians died on this completely gone, disappeared, nobody knew, the Soviets didn't know where they were. Um, because we knew where, where the sub went down, we thought that 
um, we could glean some information, right? This was all about stealing their secrets. They're trying to steal our secrets back and forth. So this seemed to be like a potential coup. This is a picture of the submarine as, as it's leaving, um, leaving its, its base. So it turns out this thing went down deep. What's the average depth of the ocean? Oh, flip back to your notes. What is it? Right, three point something, right? More than three, the average depth greater than three and a half kilometers of the world's ocean. This guy sank in almost five kilometers of water. So this is deep, right? Even for the ocean, this is deep. So this is, this is deep in the water, and this is about 1,200 kilometers uh, northwest of Hawaii. So this is in, this, in the Pacific, far away from any land. The USS Halibut goes and takes this picture you see on the right, which is been declassified. So this is, this is lowering a camera essentially on a rope and then having the camera take some pictures. So we can confirm that indeed this vessel is there, but we don't have the technology to go that deep to, to physically grab it and, and do anything. This has all these dead dudes on it. This has secret code books. This has, this has nuclear weapons on it. This has all this, all this in, you know, incredibly valuable stuff in the midst of the Cold War. So the CIA freaks out. And the CIA starts going insane. And they said, we really need to get the submarine. The Soviets have no idea where it is. But the, the technology doesn't exist to go and get this, uh, this, this substance, this boat. And because it's the Cold War, and because it's not education, like that, money is no object, right? So let's throw as much money as we can possibly think about this. So what do they do? They go to crazy man Howard Hughes, right? Recluse billionaire, uh, guy that built you know, Hughes Aircraft and was, was incredibly helpful in, in the war effort and Patriot and all this and that. And this is the guy that all, all those, those Tony Stark movies, right? Tony Stark's dad, this is who he it, is literally you know, patterned off dress and all that kind of stuff with this dude. Um, he has to have the spruce goose and all kinds of other interesting things that he was involved with in the coastal zone. But suffice it to say, um, let's go to this dude and let's see if, if, we, if he wants to help us. And the answer is, okay, what should we do? They say, let's build a giant ship to float out in the ocean and go pull up this Russian submarine from five kilometers down underneath the ocean. Sound cool? Great, he says, right? So we start this, this classified um, project to build what's called the Glomar Explorer. This is a, uh, supposedly an exploratory ship, a research vessel. In this case, not so much research for academic research, but research for uh, industry. So the idea is we'll build this giant mobile platform. It will have the ability to throw down tentacles and, and nets and what, what have you to go down and scoop up this ship, which is, I don't remember, 130 something feet long or something like that, and, and bring this vessel up to the surface intact. So uh, th they do this. They eventually go down and they, and, and they, they find the thing. Uh, what was just declassified uh, a couple days ago was the fact that um, when these guys are out at sea, there's these Russian trawlers, fishing trawlers, right, that would hang out around them. They're watching them. They didn't know what they were doing. So they, 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 thought, they, were, they thought they were doing something, you know, nefarious or something, but they didn't understand they were getting their submarine. <laughs> so they go down. They finally catch, get, get the submarine hooked up start raising it, it's off the seafloor bottom, it's coming to the surface, and then for reasons that aren't entirely clear yet, um, essentially it buckles and tears and rips open. And most of, well, it's the CIA, so it's hard to know, but it sounds like most of the submarine rips off and dribbles down and, and crashes back down the bottom of the ocean, never to be recovered. About a 32-foot section of the hull comes up. And according to the CIA, no code books in there, no <laughs> nuclear bombs and stuff, right? Um, there were at least the, bod the bodies of at least six Russian soldiers, which the CIA, with which they then have a formal burial at sea, and they videotape that. 
Um, so at some point in the, now, I think it's been it's been given to the Russians. But the idea was, uh, you know, treat these these fellow seafarers with respect and everything, and and, and reinter them in the ocean. Um, and so clearly, there was some stuff that was gleaned, but it wasn't as big a success as we'd like. So this is a big, huge thing, right? In today's dollars, this is about something like one to two billion dollars worth of ship construction, right? That's a lot of money. <coughs> but more importantly, it takes a couple years. You have to have a whole crew. How do, you, how do you hide that? And the way you hide it is you say that you're looking for deep sea minerals. So Howard Hughes, crazy dude, right? Say he's doing something crazy like trying to mine the bottom of the ocean. Ah, people might believe that, right? So that's what happened. And, uh, and so the, 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 this activity, the recovery, happened in the early 70s. And a year later, the LA Times breaks the story. And then a big, huge expose comes out in the New York Times um, that that's what was going on. Um, but, but this happens in the mid-70s. By the early 70s, this has spurred the first boom in deep sea mining. It was all BS, right? No, you couldn't make any money deep sea mining, but, but the Hughes Corporation said they were. And because these people saw these guys investing the, the equivalent of billions of dollars in this, other companies said, whoa, 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 maybe we should be doing this too, right? And so it led to at least four consortia coming together, American, Canadian, uh, let's see, there was some French, uh, some UK folk, and, the, and, the, and so basically these people started saying, let's go invest a bunch of money and see if we can start ourselves mining the bottom of the ocean. Um, and then all kinds of cool, anytime you invest a bunch of money in something like this, all kinds of cool stuff uh, come out. Uh, different ways of scanning the seabed um, and, and, and measuring uh, topography on the bottom of the ocean come out of this. Also, some of the mechanics go into the Monterey Bay Aquarium. Um, and, and stuff of that nature uh, to make the, in that case, to make the, the water circulate uh, in some of the deep kelp tanks and things, um, but all kinds of crazy cool stuff. Uh, so this is, this is over now. This part of our history is over. The ship, uh, a, a similar ship called the Challenger was also built that did work for many years doing um, academic research, uh, marine geo geological research, but this guy, the one that was used for the Explorer, that was used for this, this underwater stuff in the CIA, that pretty much was retired at the end of that mission and was mothballed um, in this, this US Navy Reserve Fleet, basically. And then it was finally um, uh, killed uh, a couple years ago. Broken apart, ship broken, destroyed. Um, Yes, okay, so, so this really spurs this whole, this whole interest though. What, was, what, were they be, what were they after? They're after these things. These are popularly known as, known as manganese nodules. These are precipitates, just like we talked about the, the sil silicaceous ooze and all that kind of stuff. Um, same idea. In this case, we're not entirely sure how these materials precipitate out. There's several different theories we don't know. Uh, one theory suggests it might take on the order of a million years for these nodules to grow one centimeter. Uh, not all the theories say it takes that long, but, but, but clearly it's a slow process. What we're talking about here are more generally referred to as uh, polymetallic nodules. Manganese is just the most popular flavor, but these are basically different metals precipitating out around a nucleating center. What's that center? It could be a grain of sand. It could be the bone of a fish that, 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 that died. Um, just some, some discontinuity on the surface of the ocean or in the water column, stuff starts to precipitate out upon. <clears throat> so you see these guys here, they're measuring one right over here on the right. This is, this is a massive honking thing. This is gigantor. Most are nowhere near that big. Most are more like egg to potato sized uh, substances. So, so your fist or a bit smaller than your fist. 
And these are in various fields. So here you see, here's, a, here's an ROV picture and all these little black things on the bottom of the ocean are, this is a field of nodules. And the notion is, hey, these dudes are just sitting there on the bottom of the ocean. Why don't we just go pick them up, man, right? Take them up, refine them, and then boom, we have a bunch of nickel or we have a bunch of magnesium or what have you. Not only can, uh, can manganese nodules and stuff be found at the bottom of the ocean, other resources can be found down deep. Other things that people are interested in, such as these gas hydrates. So this is, this is methane frozen. This is sort of a methane slushy. It's like going in and getting a Slurpee at 7-Eleven, except it's, it's instead of sugar crystals inside, it's, it's um, natural gas. Uh, these so-called gas hydrates are, for example, one of the reasons we had such problems with the Deepwater Horizon. We talk about that in, in a few weeks. Um, one of the solutions to essentially cap the well kept not working because there were, there were a lot of gas hydrates that, that caused fouling of the, of the seals. So uh, these gas hydrates can be important things. And these gas hydrates, here's a guy holding one, he just set it on fire, right? He's holding it in his hand. So potential, there's metal down deep, there's potential hydrocarbon reserves down deep, there's various resources down at the bottom of the ocean. Maybe we should go get those things. So this is still a thing. As I mentioned with the, uh, with the Glomar Explorer and stuff, that, that was all baloney, right? At least, at least the economics were all baloney. Um, but because of that, because of that, that, that interest in the, in the formation of these various exploratory uh, companies, folks have gone now and have actually mapped some of the, the most, there, there's four main um, uh, uh, nodule rich fields around the world, most of which are in international waters the only, the only major field that is in within a country's, totally within a country's territorial limits, there's one in the Cook Islands near where we, where we work. Um, but the rest are all in international waters. Um, and so therefore, at least in theory, you, it's much easier to go out and get, right? You can just go out and get it, um, assuming your, your um, country is not a party of the Convention on the Law on the Sea. More on that later. Um, but but so, so it's kind of a, an interesting thing. The, the only currently proposed actively being, I mean, a lot of people are studying things, but the only one that's actually going on at the moment, it's actually paused, but it's that guy on the right. So I want to show you guys a couple videos to give you a sense. Now, what we're going to see, so this is an example of deep sea mining, but this case here off of Papua New Guinea is is not for manganese nodules. Instead, these guys are going after um, material that have been deposited um, after a deep sea vent. So as you can see right here. So here's a, a black, so-called black smoker. And, th and this guy, there's a bunch of stuff. This is, this is a composite photo, but, but this is much deeper than it looks from this photo. But essentially what we have is we have all these, this mineral which hot water you know, bloom, pluming out of the bottom of the ocean. And just like these other things we've been talking about, these, this, this precipitation happens and, and this and materials can get encrusted on um, these so-called chimneys. And so this particular project in Papua New Guinea is, is, wants to go after the stuff that is coming out of these deep sea vents. To mine mineral-rich rock from the seabed, a support vessel arrives at the site and launches three mining vehicles. An auxiliary cutter slices up clumps of the rugged seabed to prepare the area for the more powerful bulk cutter. The bulk cutter has a larger cutting capacity than the auxiliary cutter, but can only work in areas prepared by the former. A hose and subsea pump are floated above the crawlers and weighted beneath the ship. Finally, the collecting machine collects the crushed rock by drawing it in as a mixture of seawater and gravel and pushing it through a pipe to the subsea pump and onto the production support vessel. 
Once on the production support vessel, the excavated material is dewatered and transferred to storage holds. Then the excavated material is transferred from the production support vessel to a container ship. So that so that, that's a quick overview of, of what they want to do. Essentially, as you see, what we have now at our disposal are things like like the ROVs in our lab, although our, although our ROVs are nowhere near this sophistication or can go to this depth, but we have this robotic technology that we can project, uh, manipulate, the, our ability to manipulate the bottom of the seafloor, other things much more easily than we did in the past. And we have a lot of these much more powerful uh, pumps and things to move water around that makes it at least it theoretically possible to, to, to move stuff from the bottom to the uh, surface waters in at least theoretically and economically um, doable uh, manner. So again, this proposal is going on in, in off the coast of Papua New Guinea. So I want to just show you an example of some of the, the sentiments around this effort. Deep sea mine opponents on the streets of New Island province. You don't need to be a rocket scientist to understand this thing. They have allies in high places and the PNG government is under pressure to pull out of the deal with Northwest Mineral. Well, I never liked them from the start, because I don't think they've ever given us um, a fair and independent uh, environmental report and study. The Canadian miner is vigorously defending its half billion dollar proposal. Um, so I, I, I'm, I'm shocked, I'm shocked to hear that. Um, I believe that we've taken a responsible approach and quite often I believe that we are misquoted and I believe that the facts are not represented correctly. At stake, an area the size of about 12 football fields on the seabed at a depth of one and a half kilometres. Known as Solwara 1, it could be one of the purest deposits of copper and gold ever mined. The people who live by the Bismarck Sea depend on fish for their main source of protein. They're bitterly opposed to the Nautilus mine and fear that toxic plume it will create deep in these waters. Remote controlled diggers will scoop up ancient deposits from hydrothermal vents, pump them to the surface, separate the rock and dump the wastewater containing mercury, selenium and possibly arsenic back to the bottom of the sea. Nautilus was granted a license last year, based in part on its environmental impact statement. It's a, it's a low risk and... Um, that was 2011 he's referring to. ...states that um, the risk of it moving into that upper layer where most of the fishing activity takes place is extremely low. Nautilus says it's consulted communities widely, but strong concerns remain about the future impact of the waste on the people. Um, we have to look at the fish consumption, how much they actually eat and how much they actually take in uh, through the, the fish itself. At the moment, I, I have no, no idea of that. Also worried is PNG's mining minister. He's from New Ireland and the son of the governor. His problem, the previous government approved the mine and also took a 30% stake. Well, we don't actually have to go into the sea to mine anything. That's where I'm coming from. But uh, see, I've uh, got to deal with this problem because the lease is already there. For now, the mine is on hold. Nautilus and the government are in dispute over financing. The outcome is being closely watched around the world by mining giants like Nautilus shareholder Anglo-American and Pacific nations looking for an economic miracle. What we found typically is uh, there, there is a fear, uh, there's a lack of understanding and knowledge about what we're going to be doing, and it's incumbent on us to make sure that we do inform people properly. But the anti-mining campaign is gaining momentum. In the case of New Ireland in particular, on this particular exercise, I don't want to be the first in the world. Nautilus says it has the science right. Whether the risks are real or not, the company may be losing the public relations battle here in the deep sea gold rush. In New Ireland, Stefan Armbruster, World News Australia. And this is, uh, this is last year. The development of the Nautilus Solwar 1 project in New Ireland is a threat of being terminated as the Canadian mining company is faced with a severe financial crisis. In a recent media release, the Canadian mining company said it continues to seek and consider various alternate sources of financing in order to maintain the development of the Solwar 1 project and the company's other operations. 
not to have said it required significant additional funding in order to complete the build and deployment of the seafloor production system that will be used at the Solwara One project. The company and its operating subsidiaries are currently exploring alternatives for delaying project spending and securing immediate bridge financing and additional project funding in its attempt to raise 100 million US dollars back in April. However, there is no assurance that Nautilus will be able to obtain both. This may result in the company taking various steps to maximize shareholder value, including spending or terminating the development of the seafloor production system and the Solwara One project. PNG is shareholder to 15% of Solwara One and 27% of total shares were sold, but raised just $28 million. So that's where we are in, at the moment with uh, this, this uh, Canadian company uh, having, a, having problems raising money and unclear if this is going to work economically. A, a great example of the challenges we face in coastal management, right? So here we have, in this case, this is a, a small Pacific Island nation, right? Not, not massively wealthy, maybe not a, a, a huge amount of technological sophistication they could necessarily bring to bear to do things like create environmental impact statements. What will this mining activity do to fish stocks, uh, uh, you know, exp potential exposure pathways for people, all this and that. It is very clear that whatever this extraction is, will be, is, is absolutely non-renewable, right? Now, if we wanted to put a pause for a million years, we could probably grow more manganese nodules, but that's not a realistic thing in our, in our lifetimes or probably the lifetimes of our civilization, right? So, so we have to look upon these more as a clear-cutting type of, type of activity. And maybe it's justified, maybe the benefits outweigh, outweigh the downsides, but it's very difficult to figure out how you even do an environmental impact statement in something like the deep sea for all these things that we've, we've just started touching upon, but um, that we'll talk about more in a second. But you know, incredible pressure, uh, temperature challenges. We don't, we don't have many devices that can go down there and monitor the fish and the critters and all the goings on. So it's hard to therefore know what the impact will be. And all this is happening in oftentimes countries that are very um, economically stressed. And here someone comes in and goes, hey, can I give you a million bucks to go do this thing over here? A lot of times the, the, the your local jurisdictions are like, sure, dude, we'll take that, right? So uh, a classic ESRM challenge here, um, in this case, off of Papua New Guinea. All jump-started by the fact the CIA wanted to go get a Russian sub. Cool? Questions? No, everybody's totally wowed. Okay, another key aspect of the basic goings on of the ocean is this notion of um, uh, variable, as you guys, as we saw before with our water demonstration, we'll do another one in a second. As we saw before with our water demonstration, different masses of water of different densities um, will behave differently, right? So the denser stuff will sink, the lighter stuff will float. What makes something dense? Well, there's various things, but the most, the most uh, simple, straightforward thing for most of our of our uh, concerns in talking about how things move around the planet would be gross salinity and gross temperature. So here on this figure, I'm showing you uh, temperature on the uh, x-axis, or excuse me, the y-axis, and then salinity here on the y. Hey, what's, what's the typical salinity of the ocean, world's ocean, you guys? Uh, uh, 33, I mean, 33 is okay, 34, 35, better, better answer, but yeah, 33 is, is in the ballpark. And 33, what are, what are the units again? Parts per, thousand. Parts per thousand, thank you, okay. And so in terms of percentage, what, 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 what's the percentage salinity if we use just regular percent? 35. Yeah, 3.5, right? So instead of 35 parts per thousand, that's also 3.5 parts per hundred, right, percent. Cool, all right, 
So what I'm showing you guys here are, these are clines. So these are surfaces of the same, same value. So these, these side to side, or these, uh, these um, sort of upper right to lower left trending lines are lines of equal density. So that's, that's saying that um, if, uh, let's see, we could be, call it 30, 35 uh, 34.5 PPT in terms of salinity at 25 degrees Celsius, you guys with me? It, the water is gonna be the same density as uh, water that's, I don't know what this is, 14 and a half degrees Celsius and 31 uh, parts per thousand. You guys with me? So we can change temperature. So, so we could think about it like this. So let's pick one particular cylinder. Let's pick 35 uh, parts per thousand. Well, let's say it's 10 degrees uh, C. If we warm the water up, and so, so maybe, we're, maybe we're about 1.027. If we warm the water up and go to 20 degrees, we've lowered the density. Similarly, if we take that same salinity water and, and chill it and drive down, we've, we increase the density. And the same goes for uh, adding fresh water or having some of that fresh, some of the H2O evaporate. Everybody with me? So, so density is the key thing. Density is gonna drive a lot of the stuff. Density is the product of temperature and um, salinity amongst other things. Sounds good, questions? All right, cool. So here's what this can do. So here's a, here is a, a cartoon version here. So here we're going from the surface of the, uh, and in fact, the, the only typical graph that you guys will see that tends to be reversed when we're talking about the global ocean or the coastal zone, anything aquatic, the only thing that, that we usually change is depth. So normally by convention, we start our, if we had a two, two axis graph, right? So let's say on the X axis here, we go from zero or a low value and to the right, it would be a higher value, right? Everybody with me? And if we were uh, on the Y axis, we similarly start at zero or a low value and the, the value, the units, whatever they are, go up as we go, as we go toward the top of the graph. That's totally legit, you can do that. But by convention, people rarely graph things that way when we talk about stuff in the ocean. That's because you and I are surface dwellers. So we usually talk about depth as starting off as zero at the top of the graph and the value of the y-axis increasing as we go down. It's not technically wrong, it's just different from our typical expectation. But then, but then when we look at the graph, the stuff that we see at the top of the figure is the surface of the ocean and the stuff that we see farther down into the, the, the plane of the graph is farther down into the water and that makes more intuitive sense for us. Yeah? All right, so that's, that's what we're showing here. So here, uh, the, the low value, in this case depth, which is zero at the surface of the ocean, starts here and then we're increasing depth as we go down. Okay. Here is the, and then this is, this is a, a, a cartoon version of the Earth, but here we go. Here is the equator, zero latitude. And then as we go towards 90 degrees north or 90 degrees south, we go towards the Arctic or the Antarctic. And so this is what we tend to see. We tend to see water at the poles is what? Is relatively cold, right? It's, it's the polar area. It's getting the least amount of direct solar radiation of anywhere on the planet. The equator is getting most of the direct solar radiation. That's the warmest area. The water is the warmest on average. And so we tend to see, we tend to see, oh, this is cold water. We just, we just talked about cold. Even if it's the same salinity, cold tends to be more dense. It's gonna tend to sink. So we tend to see sinking water at the poles, right? And then we tend to see uh, uh, warmer water, lighter water at the, um, at the equator. Salinity will also vary a little bit with latitude. So I told you guys 34, 35 is a good, is a good sort of ballpark. We actually do see some variation when we get really close to the, the poles. And uh, so salinity is gonna change a little bit, but so does evaporation. 
So that warmness that makes the water warm also tends to make the surface so warm that you can have water molecules start to get really, really excited, all that heat energy we mentioned, and actually turn into a gaseous stage and actually float away. So then leave more salts behind. So all these things are going on. Um, add to that storm systems, which we haven't yet talked about yet, but these storm systems that tend to move in discrete bands around the planet. So some areas, so, some uh, latitudes are going to tend to be wetter. Other latitudes are going to tend to be drier. So all this stuff is adding structure, right? Salinity varying, temperature varying, evaporation varying. So it's acting as different forcing factors on this water planet that you and I live on, right? And this mass of water is getting pushed and pulled and tweaked and twittered all these different ways from these different forces. Um, and uh, as you guys saw in my little demo last time, knowing nothing else, just having salinity differences can actually drive motion, can drive movement. So we can get all kinds of, of movement from only the, the changed salinity of the water mass. So this is a cross section of the Black Sea over here now where we work in Turkey. And then this is the Mediterranean and this is the Atlantic. We can get uh, significant currents moving around here basically driven by the different uh, salinities, the different densities of these water masses. Altogether, this tends to produce stuff that looks like this. Again, this is the surface of the ocean. This, the ocean is three-dimensional. It's complex. But let's just look at the surface. What do you see there? You see gross, on average, movement, net movement of water. So we have these large things called gyres, big, giant, spinning, spinning wheels. Uh, they spin clockwise, or excuse me, they spin counterclockwise in the southern hemisphere. They spin clockwise in the northern hemisphere. And that's going to mean, check it out right here. Here's what we just talked Here's the poles. Here's that cold water, right? The, the, again, we're just talking about the, the water near the surface now, of the, the skin of the ocean. But here we go. We have this water going down, boom, 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 tending to pull cold water down. That cold water tends to be um, oxygen rich, tends to be more nutrient rich because if it's cold, there isn't as much life doing the things life does, making babies and stuff like that. So there's a lot of unused nutrients, unused materials. So here, look, look what we do. We bathe Alaska, the Pacific Northwest, California in this relatively nutrient rich, oxygen rich, relatively cool water. But then our friends over here in, in Southeast Asia and in, and in Japan, they're getting hit with relatively warm water from the tropics, right? Or, or let, let, let's, let's look over here. Uh, let's look at Florida. Florida gets relatively uh, warm water, right? It's the water that's been at the surface. It's the water that life has already used up, right? We've sucked out a lot of the nutrients. Tends to not be oxygen rich, tends to be warm, tends to be nutrient depleted, that kind of stuff. Um, and so that, that, that's one of the reasons why right here, when you jump in the water off of North Carolina or Georgia, you're like, damn, it's warm. You jump off ours and people are like, oh my God, it's so cold. Unless you grew up in this water, then you're like, it's not that cold, right? So cold water bathing us, warm water bathing us. And clearly plants and animals and critters of all kinds are gonna respond to that, right? So again, basic physics is leading to this movement, twisting, turning, manipulation of water and then in turn life is responding to that and then life in turn is interacting with that movement everybody good what i think it's time for an interaction yes Yes, so, so precipitation and evaporation are affecting salinity, which is then going to affect density. And the density is the thing that's going to make it float or sink or, or, or tend to move. 
So, so coldness or hotness doesn't make the water sink, right? It's, it's, it's the fact that that's the, 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 this water mass is hot. So therefore, those molecules, by definition, if they're hot, they're, they're, they're bumping around. So because they're bumping around, they're, they're less compacted, and so, they're le so then they're less dense. So the density is the thing that's actually going to drive the, say, floating or sinking of that mass of water. So it might be driven by the temperature, but, but the tr temperature is going to have an impact on the density, and the density is going to be the thing that does it. Good. Other questions? All right, cool. Okay, so, so l l let's do a little exercise, and then, uh, then we'll take a little small break. So here we go. Here's a little exercise. So, so um, we've been talking about this difference in density, salinity, all this stuff at the global scale. And it clearly has implications at the global scale. It also has implications at the organismal scale. So here's the, one of the most obvious. Does anybody keep aquarium fish at home? Fresh water or salt water or anything? What do you guys, what do you guys have? Fresh water or salt water? Fresh water. Fresh water? Fresh water? Does anybody have any salt water critters? Oh, nobody's seen our mascots in there next to Emily's desk? Oh, you guys got to go look at our mascots before you go on to your uh, pee break or whatever in a minute. Um, so, okay, cool. So these fish uh, suck out the oxygen, the gaseous oxygen that's in the water through their gills. Their gills are essentially their lungs, right? So just like our lungs, we have these structures, and then inside those structures are finer structures, which are finer structures. And, fine. and finally, we get down these very, very, in our case, alveoli, but these little teeny thin membranes that allow gas diffusion. Uh, per, gas permeates across this barrier, right? So when we breathe out, we're, getting, we're expelling a lot of this carbon dioxide. And when we breathe in, we're sucking in relatively oxygen-rich air, right? And then inside our lungs is where this exchange happens. With fish, that's happening in their gills. And so, so these gills are out there, and they're, they're doing their due. Now, you might think of, so if you're just a fish in the middle of the ocean, you're, you're all good. But if you're in an area where, that has wide swings of salinity, that might be bad because here I have my, my, very, my very delicate tissue that's helping me breathe. And again, the oxygen isn't, it, we don't have a gas sucker upper. It's a semi-permeable membrane. It's tissue that's going to allow this gas to diffuse across this barrier, but it still is a barrier. Inside the barrier is fish, right? Fish bloodstream. Outside that barrier is the wide, nasty world of the ocean with bacteria and, and viruses and poop and all kinds of food and everything else out there, right? So, um, yeah. So, uh, no, since nobody has any aquarium fish, just the, the, usually I do a thing about aquarium fish, but, but that's okay. All right, l l l let's look at this example. Here's our hypothetical estuary, right? So the, the place where the ocean and the land and, and the freshwater meet, right? Could be, a, could be a salt marsh, could be a mangrove marsh, could be whatever it is. But in this case, um, well, well, this is our theoretical thing. So here's, here's our theoretical estuary. Um, we're going to say that, that we have daily a semi diurnal tide, so the tide's going to come in at some time. In other words, the, the, the ocean is going to rise and tend to push a saltier lens of water into here at some time of the day. And other times of the day, the tide's gonna go out. And so these freshwater sources, these freshwater sources are gonna tend to dominate then, and they're gonna tend to push that saltwater lens farther out to sea. Cool? Make sense? Okay, so I'm, I'm gonna tell you that in this particular example, our theoretical example, we can vary from zero freshwater to pure seawater over the course of a couple hours. So let's say it's a really crazy tide, right? So how are we gonna, how are we gonna deal with this? So I'm gonna cut this into three zones. We have zone C out here, close to the ocean, zone A over here, closest to the river, and then zone B in the middle. And so I'd like you to, so I'd like you guys to tell me uh, which zone is going to have the greatest salinity fluctuations over say 24 hour period which one is going to have the greatest diversity of crabs 
and which zone is and, and where are sea cucumbers going to be restricted to? Sea cucumbers are an echinoderm. They're a slow moving, a slow moving echinoid. So they look like a, they look like a like a cucumber, and they move very slowly, and they ingest. They make their living sucking up sediment, <clears throat> throwing it through their gut. Their gut eats all the bacteria on the sediment, and they poop out the sediment at the end. Awesome critter, awesome critter. <laughs> sea cucumbers. So okay, so we have sea cucumbers, and then we'll have crabs, and we'll just say, for this purpose of this discussion, crabs can move fairly fast, right? They kind of kind of up and down or wherever they're going. Okay. So think about it for a second. Where, where do you, so think about the answer to to these three questions. B. B. So show a hand. So don't wimp out. Don't be a bunch of wimps here. You got to vote. Your options are A or B or C for each of these questions. Okay. So here we go. Salinity. Where's my Where's my thing to dig it? All right. A B C. Okay. So show of hands that think B is going to be the greatest fluctuation salinity. Oh, crap, hold up. B looks like it wins. <laughs> I'll just say 1,000 million. OK, good. Uh, anybody say A? 1A? No, no, no. Oh! A oh, a stretch. <laughs> anybody say C? Oh, so 100% of people say B, you're correct. You are correct. You guys are so smart. I'm going to give you a star, a purple star. All right, cool. So right, obviously, that should make sense, right? We, we have, we have the, the water coming in from C, excuse me, the salt water coming in from C. So C, which will fluctuate a bit too, is going to be dominated by the, sali the, the oceanic salinity. So it might vary a little bit, but it's going to be fairly close to C. A which again, it might vary in a really, really high tide, it might get a little bit of salt up in there, but it's gonna get maybe a few parts per thousand or something like that, right? The biggest change is gonna be B, which is gonna go from completely fresh to completely salt, at least in my theoretical example, uh, every day. So that's, that, that's, that's sort of by definition what's going on. Okay, good, sounds easy. How about crabs? Okay, you gotta vote for B. Who else? Okay, so, 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 and why? why? Why would you say B? Well, okay, so I feel like when there's a lot of salt there, it'll move up and take advantage of the nutrients and stuff, and they don't mind moving quickly when the salinity changes and they don't like it as much. Okay, okay, so. Take advantage so, of these nutrients and then move back. And okay, cool. So these crabs are highly mobile. So if they're in, and they have gills too, but if, if, it's a bad situation, they can kind of run out of the way, is the argument. Could be different species of crabs in zone B rather than C. Like, it has both. It has the high salinity and also mid and low salinity. So it could have different species. Ah, okay, so, so good. Okay, so the argument there is that because of all, because this, these different environmental conditions, maybe they can, maybe there's a greater diversity of critters that each one might specialize in a different aspect of that condition, maybe. And then maybe tacking on the argument about mobility, ah, they can, if it gets too much of uh, a non-desirous condition, they can just kind of run to the area that is, is uh, good for them or, or works for them. Cool. Any other arguments for or against or for A or C there? Okay, so show of hands, who says A? The greatest diversity of crabs. Oh my God, it's, it's, you guys are very powerful argumenters. <laughs> who says C? What, who says B? Oh my God, everybody says B. Okay, good. Okay, uh, before we talk about the answer, let's okay, how about the la last one, which is sea cucumbers. So where would sea cucumber, where might you think sea cucumbers would be restricted to? Okay, somebody, somebody, give, me your, somebody give me a reason why they think C would be the answer. Right, right. So, well, I don't mean to say right. I mean, I don't want to say that. I said, okay, good, good <laughs> argument. Good argument, good argument. Okay, so, so they're, they're um, rip these guys, so this is how fast a sea cucumber moves. Right? If they're jamming, if they're like really, really scared, they go like this fast, right? So, so they, really, they really don't move anywhere near a, a typical fish speed or, or uh, 
something like a mobile invertebrate like um, uh, crabs move. So, so they really are stuck wherever they, they are. Okay, so, so who says A for sea cucumbers? No, who says A? Who's, oh, A. Oh, got an argument for A. Oh, yeah. Tell me the, what's the argument for A. I love it. Freshwater sea cucumber. Freshwater sea cucumber. <laughs> right. Right. Screw the name. I'm going to call it freshwater sea cucumber. Nice, bold move. I, I appreciate that. I appreciate it. I'm wearing my pirate garb today, so that was, very, that was a very piratical, piratical response to, uh, to sea cucumbers. Anybody say B? And everybody else, everybody else is C. Is that right? Okay, cool. So here's the, here's the answer. So here, here's the salinity profile, which you guys can also read as density, but in, in the context of right now, we're just talking about salinity in terms of how it impacts critters. Uh, so here we go. So here's the so-called salt wedge. Now, our fresh water is always going to be lighter than the sea, so the fresh water is always going to tend to ride above salt, the, the, the ocean water. And, and, and therefore, the salt water is always going to be denser and tend to sort of sneak underneath the fresh water. So we get the so-called tongue or wedge of, of, of salty or dense water underneath and the tongue or wedge of lighter fresh water up on the top. All right, so here's, here's the conditions. Here's a river water rushing in. Here's the big ocean right there. And under high tide, it's going to tend to push this dude Assuming it's going to tend to push this salt wedge farther in. You guys with me? So both, both the elevational surface of the ocean is going to rise, as well as uh, any, this point here, if we just pick some random points, it's going to tend to become saltier on average. And then the reverse, that low tide goes out. We're going to be so in this case, we're dominated by the ocean, oceanic conditions. In this case, we're dominated by the riverine conditions. So here, this fresh water is going out. And check out, here's my crab. My crab is here, and he's in a little salty water. And here he's like, whoa, damn, dude, I'm in, I'm in uh, whatever, uh, 15 parts per thousand. So, so half the strength of seawater now. Uh, oops, okay, so I thought I had another slide here. Uh, we'll go to this one next. Um, the other one is, has to do with, um, again, if you guys, the best example is my fish, the fish in there. So our little clownfish in there next to Emily, um, this fish sometimes get, uh, parasites on them. Not our fish because we take care of them well, but, but you know, it's fairly common fish get parasites on them. There's different kinds of parasites fish, uh, fish can have. Sometimes they're internal, sometimes they're external. Sometimes there's so-called things like sea lice, little other crustaceans that, that grab onto their gills or grab onto their skin. And these guys are, and, and the fish in there, just to be clear, these, these, are, these are tropical coral reef dwelling fish. These, these are clownfish, palmocentrids. And so those guys, um, if they get a uh, crustacean on them, the fish is bummed, right? How do you get the, you don't have any thumbs, right? You can't go and get your, paras can't scratch yourself, right? They might rub against a piece of coral, they might rub against some sand, but it's hard for them to get clean. In the case of, of keeping critters alive in an aquarium context, what we can do is we can take those guys out, and so salt water, and we can throw them into fresh water. And it's a, there's a trick. Throw them in for a few seconds, and then that little crustacean on the outside of him, ah, he like freezes up and dies. And then we take him out. Take the fish out, excuse me. So the parasites dropped off. But when we throw the fish in the water, the fish is going to go like this. And he's going to freeze. Well, at first he's going to spaz a bit. And he's going to, he's going to like stiffen. And so if you're trying to get parasites off these guys, what we want to do is we want to leave them in there for a second so that the parasites drop off, but then scoop them really quickly and throw them back in salt water. Any ideas why? Osmotic shock, that's right. So when we take our, so right, when we start this treatment, our parasite on the outside of our fish and our fish, they're both used to living in seawater. When I take that, those guys and throw them into pure fresh water, now they have, they have lots of salt inside of them, inside their blood, inside their, their, their fluids, right? And so now we have a lot of non-salt water around them. So in, a, in, a, in effect, what happens is this fresh water rushes through their permeable membranes and, and tries to equalize 
the, the solute concentration. And so if I'm a cell of my fish, all of a sudden I'm getting super fat and I pop, right? I, I explode with too much water. So the trick is if we do it quickly, the, the dude on the outside pops and dies before too much of the gills pop and explode on the fish, right? So it's kind of a, yeah, I know, it's like this kind of torture, right? So the trick is to do it quick so that the, the fish is like, <gasps> and then throw them back in the water. Uh, and you can do the same thing with freshwater fish, same thing. If they have some para ectoparasites, you can do the same thing. You can take our freshwater fish. It's the same exact process, it's just reversed. Freshwater fish, throw that freshwater fish into salt water same thing's gonna happen, but in this case, the water is gonna try to rush out of our, uh, tend to rush out of our um, uh, 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 blood and, and blow out the gills of your freshwater fish because it's going out into the surrounding uh, water to try to dilute that water. And, uh, and so same thing, you try to do it just for a second just to let the external guy get hurt and then suck him back and put him in and, then be real nice to him for a couple days and let, let, as, he, as he heals his, his wounds. So the same thing will happen with, um, with anything that doesn't have the ability. So you and I, we have hard skin and we, we can plug our mouths up, right? And when we jump in the water, we're okay, right? Our lungs aren't exposed to water, to, to, to the osmotic pressure, right? But fish, because their gills have to, by definition, be in intimate contact with that water, they're, they're gonna be screwed. So it turns out sea cucumbers also have gills, also have this tissue, and they're breathing just like our fish and stuff are. And so, so if we throw the, if these guys get anywhere out of this pure, pure salt water, they'll, they'll pop. They'll like be a, like, a, like, a, like an anti-Tom Brady football, they'll just pop, and then they'll, they'll die, right? So therefore, so therefore, this is what we tend to see. We tend to see um, freshwater species are really abundant in the freshest of the fresh water, next to the mouth of the river. Our, our, our critters like our, um, like our sea cucumbers that can't deal well with any fresh water, they, they reach their uh, uh, most ab highest abundance, highest diversity in the, in the um, ocean. And then things like our crabs tend to do well right right up uh, right up here in the um, in the estuary so most salinity flux is in the middle this is crab city sea cucumbers right here why are crab one last thing before we take a break so so there's the answer which you guys were good um, why is why are there so many crabs here why aren't there a lot so so crabs might have an issue up here why aren't there why aren't there a gazillion million crabs out here in the pure ocean the pure, pure seawater Current, possibly. Good, yeah, could be. Could be. More nutrients in the fresh water coming down, like flowing in. Uh, nutrients or stuff to eat. Stuff to eat. So they're, they're not directly consuming the nutrients, but, but this is a really, this is the most, one of the most productive areas in, around. So these guys have the ability to physically move out of the, out of the bad place at the bad time, but then... That also means they can move in and exploit it when it's the good time, right? So this is really, really resource rich area. So if you do have the ability to move in and, and attack it, and we see that in the case of coyotes, we see that in the case of rattlesnakes, we see that in the case of crabs, we see that in the case of predatory fish, really, really, um, really, really productive areas if you can take the downsides or you can get out of the way of the downsides very very productive one time when i was first working at magoo lagoon where i worked in grad school um uh out in the salt marsh this guy said you ever see any rattlesnakes out there i was like dude it's a salt marsh what are you totally high there's no, there's no rattlesnakes in the salt marsh like oh i thought they were like nah dude let me tell you i'm a scientist dude there's no rattlesnakes so like dude they're like up in the santa monica's you need to learn to Oh, sorry. So guy leaves. Next day I walk out, this is the summertime, I counted 16 rattlesnakes on the trail that we walked on. So I was like, oh man, I hope I never see that guy again. Do you think there was a rattlesnake at the library? Like, Today? Like two weeks ago. Like uh -uh. Someone, someone sent me a picture. Inside the library? No, it was right outside. It was going against the, the door. I don't, I don't know if like, you heard X 
Excellent. Thanks, police. All right, 10-minute break. 